Hey, hey, here we are. It is all of the Avengers. And this episode, we are covering Avengers 8 and 9 from back in, I think, 1964. I am your host, Van Allen Plexico. And I'm joined tonight for this episode by my good friend from, from way, way, way back, David Wright. Welcome aboard, David. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad. Yeah, we've had some technical issues, but we got things rolling now. We're ready to roll. Yeah. Yep, I'm ready. So, <laughs> Tell folks who you are and what you do. Well, my name is David Wright, and by day I'm a video producer, and at night I am a writer and a comic book fan. So I am the author of Galahad's Doom, epic fantasy action adventure. The first two books are out. You can find them at galahadsdoom.com and on Amazon, and uh, the third one should be out sometime this year. And I have been a lifelong Avengers fan. Uh, my first issue... Off the Rack was issue 211 in 1981 when I was about 10 years old, and uh, I followed it for a little over 20 years. I got out at the end of uh, the Disassembled storyline by by Brian Michael Bendis, and then and then the JLA Avengers um, uh, miniseries after that. So, and I have since gone back and pretty much filled out my entire collection. I have uh, I have every issue, literally every issue, starting with number 19, I think, and these the first 18, I have several of those, including copies of actual uh, vintage copies of the two books we're going to discuss tonight. Wow. I can't, I can't show them off, though. I have them in deep storage. They're not with me, but I, I do own them. They are in Fort Knox, carefully yeah. stored away with our nation's treasures, I'm sure. Um, yeah, we're uh, still, these are going to be the last two from Masterworks number one, because I talked about, yeah, there it is. There's d just two different covers, but the same. This is one Larry Davis gave me at Dragon Con a few years ago. Um, I did issue 10 here solo last time, and now we're going to cover, this is backwards to me. This is so hard to do. Um, eight and nine, which is the famous first Kang issue and the first Wonder Man issue. So you know, it's not just the Fantastic Four back then that was rolling out big Marvel properties every issue. Avengers was rolling out some pretty long lasting things almost every issue as well. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say that I, I'm glad to be able to get on your show uh, during these first 10 issues because uh, one of my most pr prized possessions is is actually this copy of the Masterworks because you will see that right here. I have. Oh, holy cow. I met Stan Lee in 1993 at Dragon Con. I caught him as he was cutting across the lobby of the Hyatt. And um, I was going to ask him for an autograph. And he he interrupted me asking me for how to find the Marvel booth. So I had to tell Stan Lee how to get to Marvel. And, <laughs> and then he looked at me and he probably used this line on everybody. But he looked me right in the eye and he said, thanks. You're my hero. And I was like, ah, and then he started to leave and I had to catch up again. I said, wait, 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 wait. And I had this with me and he signed it real quick. So that is, That's so that cool. is a 1993 Stanley mm -hmm. autograph. So I'm very, very pleased That's, with that. That's much cooler. My Stanley story is that I was sitting across from him at my table at Dragon Con a couple of years ago, his last appearance there. And uh, it was when they got the cult, they got this, they got the, um, comics what is it called pop artist alley whatever that that i'm always on and he was in there across from us they had it so cold that he had to just leave and i couldn't blame him but what was cool was that uh our our, our good friend jared albrick the the yard sale artist he was in the booth next to me of course uh because we were always together there uh you know he's the inker on a lot of the stuff that we do yes among other things in our coast on the james bond show and Jared had done, uh, this is so cool. I got to tell this story real quick. Jared gets yard sale stuff and then repurposes it as, as new art. And he had gotten this like incredibly elaborate gold frame. I mean, it was like the most fancy out of Downton Abbey or something gold frame. And it had like a picture in it of like a barn or something. You know what I mean? It's like totally incongruous. Somebody was selling it for like a dollar at a yard sale, this incredibly ornate frame with like a picture of barn. So he <laughs> took the picture of the barn out and painted a portrait of Dr. Doom like this. Oh, nice. Just perfect, right? That's what <laughs> Dr. Doom picture was in. And, and one of the guys from Stan Lee's entourage came over and gave Jared 200 bucks for it and gave it to Stan. Oh, oh man. That's so yes. cool. I was just sitting there watching this all transpire like, 
So <laughs> you know, you know that got handed down. Like somebody has that now. It's like, oh yeah, that yeah, is absolutely. awesome. That That's is cool. incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah. Could, Dragon Con's always depressing in that way for me because I sell my books and make a few hundred bucks, and Jared sells his art and makes a few thousand bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid artists, man! <laughs> Dang it. Hmm. But to get back to the original point, uh, you're talking about how the major lasting concepts being introduced in Avengers, that absolutely did happen. I feel like it happened at an accelerated pace uh, once Roy Thomas really started hitting oh, yeah. his stride, which yeah. comes a few years, four or five years after the books we're talking about tonight. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, uh, in these Stanley issues, we get a lot of characters and concepts that um, that that do prove lasting. So I'm having earphone issues. Um, there's one thing I wanted to say as we get into this, and this is something that's been building up in my mind as I have reviewed the previous uh, eight issues, I guess, plus the Fantastic Four. And that is, I think that Stan and Jack together did an amazing job of plotting and scripting these stories for what they were at the time, for sure. And Stan certainly gives a lot of attitude and colorfulness to the dialogue and everything. But one thing I continue to notice is, is one is a lesser problem and one is a more like endemic problem. The lesser problem is he occasionally like forgets what character he's writing and they start sounding the same. And it's really annoying, especially when it's Thor, for example, who has a very specific way of, of speaking, you know, and the, the more like endemic problem overall is that, at least in the event is probably not so much in the individual solo books, but in the Avengers, for the most part, the Avengers don't have a lot of individual personality that comes through. You wouldn't really know much about their characters. If you only read the Avengers back then, he Stan seems to lean a lot on, well, you know how Iron Man is normally in his book. You know how Thor is in his book. You know how, you know, now we're putting them together and they all just kind of speak and act the same. And it's, it's a little disappointing so far because Thor doesn't act or sound like Thor. Iron Man is just kind of generic guy in armor standing there doing stuff. And occasionally he says, oh, but my transistors, oh, my repulsors, you know. And I, I'm just kind of disappointed that for all the crackling, wacky, witty dialogue, there's just not much characterization. Now, the villains... It feels like he pours all the effort into the characterization of the villains because Zemo is very clear who he is, you know, and the Enchantress and the Executioner and Kang here and Immortus and all. They all have kind of very distinct personalities. Loki did. But um, it just feels like the Avengers are like generic five people hanging around a house waiting to go fight somebody. Is that am I crazy? No, you're not crazy. I, I think you're right. They the heroes' voices do tend to run together in in these in these books i tend to kind of chalk it up to the fact that he was probably working very quickly you know he was yeah. having to do so many books at once and i know that in the case of jack kirby where he was working on a lot of different books and doing a lot of layouts for different artists there were only two books that truly got his creative attention and those were fantastic four and thor and i mm -hmm. feel like for stan lee the only books Prior, you know, at this stage in the 60s, like before Silver Surfer got his own series and stuff, is the only books that really got Stan Lee's attention were Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. And so, and everything else just that was coming out during this time kind of feels like a rush job. Yeah. And, and I, other than the broad strokes of, you know, of Jan's, you know, inane, you right. know, flirting yes. and... And like Hawkeye's, you know, being a jerk, you know, the, the, the broad, easy things you can do to kind of, mm. it, it, there was, you're right. There wasn't a lot of nuance or individuality to the personalities. Um, and uh, again, I, I think that's just a matter of, of him having to turn out so much so fast. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and I don't think it's unfair to him to say that. Um, before we get into this issue with Kang, I'm going to go ahead and do it now before I forget. I want to thank our patrons because we have a number of patrons that make this show possible. And they include Christopher Anastasia, David Wright, Earl Ricks, Emmanuel Seaman, George Gaston, MVP Captivating Kathy Bright, and Ryan Daly. 
You all are awesome. We appreciate it. There's a Georgia Bulldog on the screen. We appreciate all that very much. And uh, well, I've got a, I got a little hobby <laughs> back here, right there, behind hiding behind this stuff. Uh, anyway, so we appreciate all of you guys, including you, David, very, very, very much. Now, um, let's go ahead and split the screen off because less of us and more comics is always a good thing. And so, as as Jim Roman might say, so I'm going to share the screen here, and we'll get. Uh, Boom. There we go. All right. So, and as I always say, this is, it's in a PDF reader. This is filling the screen that it's on. So this is as big as I can make it. So there you go. Um, let's go ahead and look at Avengers number eight. I always like to break down the cover and get your thoughts on it too. This is one of those where, you know, I mentioned this with number 10. There's not a ton. There's not dialogue. I, it's, it's, I, it's, it's a win to me when Stan lets a cover go through without a bunch of dialogue and there's no dialogue, but just like with number 10, he makes up for it with <laughs> other stuff. And he kind of goes a little crazy here because you've got um, three things about Kang and including his name and then an, the old arrow box. And then you've got, you know, kind of like a, the see the Avengers trap, see the team and you know, all that. So, uh, what do you make of this cover, <laughs> real quick? Well, I, I think the the all those boxes do make it a little more crowded. I think you could probably get away with just the one that says "King the Conqueror" and leave everything else out. Um, the image, though, is um, it's so familiar to me that it's it's hard for me to kind of assess it with fresh eyes. It's iconic, and this is like the first. This is literally the first image the world ever had of King the Conqueror. This the cover to this issue. Um, you've got you got all the Avengers in action, and it's like, who is this guy, and what are these powers, and wh what is he using? What kind of energy wall is that that he's got fighting the team off? But um, of course, you know, I, I I started reading in the '80s, so this book exists as you know purely a just an ancient artifact of of days of yore. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. came out seven years before I was born. Uh, so I'm coming. I'm coming at this book having already known who Kang is, having already read awesome Kang stories. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just I get excited at this cover because to me, there's this response of like, like I've discovered some you know Old Testament you know parchment that <laughs> that these are the founding sure. principles. You know, this is where it all started. I want to know where I can get some boots like that. That's pretty cool. Love those striped <laughs> boots. But also, I always like to bear in mind that when you're reading this stuff that's on these old classic Marvel comics that where the where the comic itself is telling you how great it is, what a <laughs> milestone it is, that Stan writing something and then telling you this is destined to be one of the great works of literature in Western civilization, and he wrote it. And <laughs> I mean, we, and we, we kind of read it almost like God printed it and said this. <laughs> you know, about Stan and Stan is over in the corner going, well, gosh, no, Stan wrote that. <laughs> I mean, if I slapped that on the front of my Sentinels books, people would kill me, but that's what he was doing, you know, so. Yeah, but again, you know, this is one of those characters and concepts that has never left the Marvel Universe. He's continued to be a major and significant character and yeah. this is his very first appearance. So here, here is Avengers the series. Uh, laying down bricks, building the foundation for the Marvel Universe. And not only that, but this issue, along with so many of Stanley's issues, right? We can nitpick the readability of Stanley issues in, you know, as modern readers. But the reality is that these issues lay down the bricks, build that foundation for the Avengers series going forward. So the King is absolutely one of the biggest pieces and here we, we got him right here. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, just appearing on Loki, the, the Disney plus series last year and, and, and setting up something big and also going to be in the next Ant-Man movie. So he's moving into the MCU now, finally in a big way. Um, let me, let me, I'm, me I'm, I'm, I want to point this yeah. out. I'm sorry. Uh, this is cover dated September, 1964. So that yeah. means this is exactly uh, the, the series is exactly one year old uh, in September here. Um, the reason we don't have 12 issues is that it started out as bi-monthly. Right. It, it debuted in September of 63, and here we are, September of 64, and we're getting King the Conqueror. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in just issue number eight. And um, 
let me, I'll tell you my quick Kang story. Um, he had just had a bunch of appearances under Engelhart in like the one thirties, one forties, just before I started reading with one fifty eight. Well, once one fifty eight was the earliest of the ones that I read. I had to get into the back issue. One sixty two was the first one I was able to get, you know, current. But I went back and got one fifty eight through one sixty one. But he had died in one forty four, I think one forty three, one forty four, uh, and they didn't bring him back until like the Roger Stern era in the early mid eighties. After I was gone, so I never read a contemporary Kang appearance, not a single one when I was reading comics the first time. He had died right before I started reading and he came back right after I left when I was in high school. So I never, but, but hold on. I got to, I'm looking for something. So bear with me here. I got to, I got to move. I don't know. I don't know what I did with it. This is great video. I know, but. All right. So I'm going to, Dan has left the show. Yeah, I found it. I found it. I found it. Okay, I found good. it. All right, here, come back. But, but, <laughs> but, let me zoom back out for just a second. I think I know what this is going to be. But I did. This is the one Kang thing I had. And this is the original copy, as you can tell. The Avengers, The Man Who Stole Tomorrow, paperback book written by our good friend David Michelini. And of course, uh, David and I both won Pulp Factory Awards the same year and we're hanging out in Chicago together getting our trophies. And I guess it was while I was there or maybe it was when I was at a convention with him a few years before I got David to sign it. So I have a cool sign thing, too. That means a lot to me. I have this one and a couple of others of these paperbacks. So that was the only, but this is a really weird Kang. I talked about him there. If you go um, to AvengersAssemble.net, uh, down at the bottom, I think, is the interview I did with him several years ago. And we talked about how I'm like, David, this the Kang that you wrote in that novel is not the Kang we know from the comics. He's like a, uh, he's more like in some ways, almost like the Joker from DC. He's kind of like a psychopathic nut. And so, but anyway, that was the only Kang I knew for a very long time. Yeah, so, Englehart, Englehart did a lot with them in the 70s, early, early mid 70s, just before you started following. Um, and mm -hmm. there, it, he he really hasn't been used that often since. I can like, you know Stern did yeah. did, a, did an arc, Walt Simonson did an arc uh, with mm -hmm. him in like the two nineties, and then you had uh, then you didn't have him again until Kurt Busick used. Well, there him. was a crossing thing, kind of, sort of, maybe. But okay, you're right. There was he he featured in Infinity War, which was company wide crossover, and he was in the crossing, which you know we're we're better off probably. <laughs> you know, yeah. forgetting that story, but you're right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then he's featured in Avengers Forever, followed up by King Dynasty. And, um, you know, I, I'm thinking that's it. That sounds like a short list, but the thing is, all those stories are massive, and they're really well done. Like to 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 write a good time travel story or a time a story about a time traveler, and to take full advantage of what that can offer and keep it straight. Um, you, you know, you probably don't want to go to that well too often, but also you, if you're going to, if you're going to write that story, you got, you got to come strong. And so all of those stories are actually really awesome. And even though there, I don't think there's really a lot, there's not much more than what I just described, but it's enough to put Kang at the very top of yes. the Avengers rogues gallery. I mean, he's, oh, yeah. he's in the top two. Uh, I think everybody consensus top two. I don't know who would disagree with that. No, he and Ultron is a one, two, they, they can fight it out. Um, I'll say this, Kurt wrote him twice, you know, once in the King, once in, once in Avengers forever. And then in Kang dynasty, I loved Kang in Avengers forever. I yes. remember thinking he was awesome. Best, best story ever, but you got to have everything that comes before it. Before yeah. It yeah. I didn't like him so much in, in Kang dynasty. I oh. felt like it was a, I felt like it was an incredible story. Very well done, incredibly well done story. But for me, the weak link in the entire thing was always Kang. He just came across as like a flat one note villain and not a colorful, interesting guy that I was. In other words, by the time we got to the end of that story, I was ready for the Avengers to just kick his butt. 
Whereas in Avengers Forever, I'm like, man, he's, he's really cool. I want to see more of him. I want him to keep doing things. And in, in Kang Dynasty, I'm just like, ah, he's boring. He needs to get beaten and let's move on. So that was kind of unfortunate, but. I have a better I have a better feeling about King Dynasty. I really enjoyed it a lot. But one thing I can say is both both of Kurt's stories, Avengers Forever and King Dynasty, really are the best stories of King the Conqueror. Like yeah. a, as a conqueror. Yeah, not yeah. just not just a guy showing up out of the time stream and saying he's a conqueror, but mm. we're we're seeing him conquer. So uh, yeah, uh, sure. those stories to me rank very high. For sure. Yeah. Didn't love the Englehart ones when I read them in, in review either, but we'll get to them in a few years probably. <laughs> we'll get there. We're going to get there. It's going to take forever. I, f- I imagine I'm going to die of old age before I ever get through this whole thing. But we'll see how it goes. All right. So let's get back to the comic. So um, I don't, I'm not going to go every, every dialogue, every panel, but I want to just talk about things that are worth talking about. So the Avengers have been summoned to speak to somebody at the Pentagon and um, they're taking that Avengers ness seriously here. I like that the Wasp pauses to to sign an autograph with a pen that's as big as she is. I never yeah, noticed. It'd be before. easier if she just, you know, grew to regular <laughs> size. But um, but I think the thing to note here is that um, how they're being treated like celebrities. They're they're very much public heroes, publicly yeah. award. You know, and it's a news event when they show up. Um, I did like that lettered by Sam Rose in our answer to Artie Simek. That's pretty good. (laughs) That's pretty Uh, good. One thing I'm going to be looking at, I know this PDF is a scan of the actual comic and these Marvel masterworks have been recolored. I'm going to be uh, looking for, I mean, every page is different. I'm not going to point out every difference, but um, if I see something significant, I'm going to, I'm probably going to point it out. The the reason that I'm, going with the scans of the originals rather than getting the masterworks or whatever up on here is that I like the ads and everything. Oh, I yeah. like that it has the feel of the original issues more and that it has the same grain that sort of the, the, the um, pulp graininess that you don't yes. get from the recolored. So, yeah, I love all these. Yeah. Um, okay. So this has a very, uh, the day the earth stood still kind of feel to it. Right. The military has been called out because this flying saucer has landed and and one person comes out. It's It feels very much like Stan had watched The Day the Earth Stood Still and basically has a time traveler instead of a space traveler to come and, and demand, you know, to take over the world. And and so the military, they're, you know, they're showing them on their advanced television technology here. Um, and you just got to love Kang here. I don't I don't love the way Kurt, uh, Jack draws him the head. The whole helmet thing is, you know, it it's going to get better. They're going to refine Kang's appearance over the years, and he's going to get better. But they had the classic colors figured out here, which is kind of odd, right? That you've got the green with the purple accents and then the blue face. you got to love that blue face. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know what... Uh, it doesn't even say who colored it. We don't get a color... Colors. Wow. Doesn't even say. Uh, and by the way, I don't know if it was Jack or Dick Ayers, but somebody just could not draw Iron Man's helmet uh, back then. It's yeah. terrible. It's terrible. Um, so it's pro- right now is probably a good time to mention that this is the final issue of Jack Kirby as yes. the Avengers artist. Yeah. Don Heck comes in with number uh, number nine. Yeah. Number nine. That's right. Uh, if you go back one spread real quick. Um, I want to talk about Avengers Mansion real quick. Um, yeah. So I, I did a read through, read through the entire series a few years ago. And one thing I looked out for from the beginning was Avengers Mansion. Like, when do we see the mansion? And we do get early looks. Like, we've already had a look, I think, before this issue. And here's another one. Mm-hmm. But just mm-hmm. like this, you're not getting a nice, clear, comprehensive, establishing shot. And no. we don't we don't really know what it looks like. And I found out that you don't really get that that look at what we know of and think of when we think of Avengers Mansion, it doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, it's never presented to us clearly until like issue 167, George Perez draws it. It's, I was going to say George actually went in and drew it. He laid it out and had like plans and everything. So I, I was wondering if you were going to say that they did it before that or if it was, cause that's right in my wheelhouse is in the one sixty. Oh, you know. Exactly. But one thing, and, and, the, go ahead. I was going to say, I would have never guessed that was the first time. I know it was insane to me that it took that long for us to finally really get to see what the mansion looks like. But yeah. what one thing interesting about the coloring and the masterworks, if you can if you can uh, see that they recolored, 
they recolored the uh, mansion in in the reprint here to um to reflect the color scheme that we're more familiar with. So oh, that, look at that. So yes, they did. That's that's kind of a, a retcon on the coloring job to bring the mansion more into line with with what we know. Yeah, that's yeah, because here it's just kind of white and gray. Yeah, that's because so they really didn't know. Cool. They hadn't figured it out. They hadn't spent any yeah. time trying to figure it out. That's super uh, cool. The only thing else I would say on this spread is I think it's kind of a lazy job on the spaceship. You know, I, I don't know. It's yeah. not very. It's not <laughs> impressive to me. But, yeah, uh, it's like a crustacean or something. Yeah. I do like them all sitting around the table here. We get these early shots that they're all kind of around the table. I, I mentioned in my review of number ten that they really in these issues take it seriously that they're having these meetings, right? They take that stuff super seriously. And that's really going to be reflected again, in the next issue we get to when do we do number nine, but, um, but well, I do like seeing them all sitting around the table. If you see there, um, it's like, whose turn is it to be chairman? And watch us personally, I think it's silly to not have a permanent leader. And then Thank Tony, you, Jen. <laughs> but then Tony Stark, the ultimate capitalist, Tony Stark says, Silly, perhaps, but more democratic. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, hilarious. And and the thing that struck me is that Giant Man, you know, that Pym is being Giant Man as a giant here for no reason, and he's like, well, I guess I'll just shrink down to normal size, not to take up the whole couch, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I'm just, well, how how can how um how to get in the door? Yeah. <laughs> how, well, how considerate of you, Hank, for one thing, when you know, but whatever. So there we go. Um, I do like, well, I don't like, I can't stand, but I had to mention, and it drives me crazy. Look at Jan. I'll bet he's not bad looking under that silly headgear he's wearing. I don't know where to begin with what's wrong with that sentence. Uh, it's, I, I don't, you know, look, I, I have reasons, I, and I can explain my reasons why we should respect Stan's work on Avengers, but those reasons do not include Janet's dialogue. <laughs> I mean, number one, why would you even say that? And number two, why would you even think that? And why? I just don't even. I don't even know where to begin. So it's um, yeah, it's not. And 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 your comment on the Kang's helmet there in the lower right of uh of that yeah. first page. I think what the idea was here was to, he was more of a, like an astronaut. This was supposed to be more like an astronaut's helmet. That's why he went so big with it. Yeah. Uh, I agree. That's not, it's not his best look. They would get it figured mm -hmm. out in the years to come, but that, that first color panel of him lounging on his invisible chair. Oh. Uh, I, I love the attitude there, Great. the body language and the arrogance. Great. No doubt. I, and again, I just I'm I'm continuously tracking how seriously they all take the, the Avengers, right? I mean, <laughs> it's like they've gotten together to form this superhero club, and yet in their minds, it's like the you know the Green Berets or the Delta Force or something, because you know state your business here by order of the Avengers. <laughs> I'm like. What, what, uh, who are the Avengers to give me orders? It's a club for superheroes. All right. I mean, I'm glad you guys are here and you saved the world and stuff, but where do you have the authority to issue orders for people to state their business? Yeah. There, there's a lot implied that like they've been set up with official government clearance or military access or authority, but, yeah. but we, but we never actually see that. It's just kind of, it's just you have to kind of infer it from their attitude on the page. And it, right. And these these yeah. early issues, they never actually like show that established. It was almost like they immediately are, were given this uh, authority and celebrity that wasn't really earned in terms of what we actually yeah. saw on the page. Exactly. It summed, you summed it up very, very well, I think. All right. So, okay. I got some cool ads here. I do want to become a master of Yubawaza. That would be awesome. <laughs> I think. And here's what kills me, by the way, about this boys, men, I'll help you master it. And then we have a, we have a, a testimonial. I weigh only 98 pounds yet. I can paralyze a 200 pound attacker with just a finger because I know Yubawaza. I'm like, Oh, so it's for women too. It says boys and men. And yet their testimony is from a woman. Then you find out it's the pretty Japanese wife of this guy. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's, it's nepotism and you there's 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 nepotism in Yubiwazi, David. <laughs> We've exposed it. <laughs> hey, 
for it's only $198. So that seems like a pretty good deal these days, right? I mean, today it would be $198. It wouldn't be $1.98. It absolutely. Well, I wonder how many Japanese wives he has because this is the pretty one. I <laughs> this wonder. is the pretty one. Well, <laughs> but you don't tell her that because she can paralyze you with a paralyze finger. With a finger. <laughs> oh man, watch out! I love it. I love it. I love it. Having <laughs> just watched uh, Ip Man one and two, you know the martial arts movies that just struck me funny. Anyway, all right, back to the action. So we see this. This is not the last time we're going to see a uh, an incarnation of Kang making Thor's hammer go into subspace or limbo or whatever and come back because that's a that's a deal that happens again in a later issue of thor where he fights immortus and i think the space phantom it's in that lead up to the celestials you know and the in the uh eternals okay and um and and either the space phantom or immortus or somebody makes the hammer disappear into limbo and that's going to make thor turn back into donald blake um so that was kind of cool if he left it left it there thor would have been disappeared um and then we got you know I, we always have our gratuitous action and there's going to be more but i want to get over here to the origin story because we're yes. going to talk about that so kang comes from the in the year 3000 where he mastered time travel and went back and was pharaoh rama tut in fantastic four number 19 so you and i have discussed beforehand like how did they decide and when did they decide and who decided that Kang and Rama Tut would be the same guy. And then, you know, in number 10, Immortus first shows up. And at some point they decide him, they're all the same guy. I mean, there ha it's like these three characters appeared very close together in different comics. And then at some point it was decided that they're all the same person. That's interesting, I think. Yeah, but I th but the answer to that is that uh, Stan Lee was behind all of that from the very beginning. This was not an invention of later mm -hmm. writers coming on and building on top of previous work and and complicating things the way the Marvel Universe happens so, with so much know. of it. Yes, yeah. yeah. So because what we see in in this issue is it ex it's explained explicitly that Kang is Rama Tut and Rama Tut. Yeah is a character that readers of Fantastic Four have already encountered and have already read. And and we and you've already gone over issue number 10 on your show. And so it's no spoiler to say there, Immortus also explicitly says that he is or was Rama Tut. So mm -hmm. um, you know, he I Stan Lee didn't like hammer it all out, lay out every detail, but you know, we know time travel is at play. Here is the same guy three different incarnations from different periods in the time stream and, you know, have at it future writers, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of a, <laughs> it's kind of a cool thing. So tell me this, is there any reason whatsoever that I should find Immortus or Rama Tut more interesting than Kang? Because I don't. <laughs> well, uh, I agree with you. I think of the three Kang, Kang's my favorite. Um, yeah. But there were some there were some interesting interesting things done with Rama Tut. Um, uh, you know, we see him uh, in Fantastic Four number nineteen, and then I don't know if you want to get into some of the stuff the later writers did to kind of tie into that event. But um, you know, people had fun fun with that, and there's some there were some cool stories that came out of it. But in terms of the characters, yeah, I, I agree. I think Kang's the I best. I just hear Steve Martin singing, "Born in Arizona, moved to Babylon, Rama Tut." <laughs> uh and i if i were to write a story i would definitely call it rendezvous with rama tut um cool so we see some cool future stuff there he is as rama tut he's got the green and the purple working that's cool mm -hmm. and the time traveling ship and everything and i guess the anachronauts and early appearance of them and then they're fighting and we get some gratuitous fighting and i'm just going to move along here thor uses the hammer I, but again, why doesn't Stan make Thor sound like Thor in the Avengers? It's like when Thor's with the Avengers, he talks like everybody else. And it drives me up the freaking wall because he should say something like, you know, lo, the Odin son hath heard enough of thy blather miscreant. Boom. You know, instead of I have heard enough. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> I, I this is the second episode of this show where I've had to write Thor dialogue on the fly because the Thor dialogue is not appropriate. I, I, now, look, um, we, we've done podcast episodes together on Roy Thomas, and you and I have slightly different takes on Roy Thomas, but I yes. think what you're missing here is you're missing Roy's Thor dialogue. I think that's... Yeah. 
That's fair. It is a lot of Roy in there. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, okay, so again, we get there. We get the sparkling force field wall, and that's one thing I do love about Kang is that he's just like, look, I've got this invulnerable force field. I don't need to do anything else. You can't, you can't mess with me. You know, um, he captures the wasp and gets thrown around and blah, blah, blah. But again, just, you know, the action's yeah. cool, but not a lot I want to talk about here. Yeah. And the, the antimatter screen is, uh, is convenient for repelling yeah. Thor's hammer. Absolutely. So they capture the Avengers. You got Thor turns back to Blake everybody's captured kind of the way that the molecule man would capture them later on. And you then think, you goes, think everybody's captured, right? But see, that's the, that's kind of the baked in misogyny or patriarchy of the day. You think all the important <laughs> Avengers are captured. All the guys are captured. So now the day is lost. What, what can we do? Who, well, who's left to save us? Let's just be grateful that in the Avengers, Stan doesn't just outright say the Avengers weakest member like he used to do with Sue. <laughs> Poor Sue. The the Fantastic Four's weakest member. I'm like, you know, once they gave her the force field, she became pretty much their strongest member. And then that was good. So, yeah. So, so we have the wasp and Rick Jones, somebody who's not an Avenger and somebody who's treated as if they're not an Avenger kind of on their own. there, going out looking for help. They come up with a plan. She's going to go look for weapons and he's going to go bring in the teen brigade because there's nothing that will, you know, if a supervillain has defeated all of the Avengers, but one, my first reaction is you need to bring in some teenagers. <laughs> That'll straighten them out. You know, I, the <laughs> teen brigade is to me a, a wonderfully quirky thing of this era of Marvel. And yes. I don't know anything about it. Like, do you even know their names other than Rick? No. I mean, there's like there's the there's the Letterman sweater guy, there's the, <laughs> there's the hat guy, there's the trench coat yeah. guy. Like I want I want a Disney Plus series on the on the hat guy. Like honestly, you know, <laughs> honestly, you could do a Disney Plus series on the Teen Brigade, and you could do it in a way that would be fun. I think. <laughs> But is it is it going to be the era of transistors and ham radios? Oh, well, that's what it's, it's got to be a period piece, man. It's got to be because otherwise it's, it's it, you know, it's, yeah. it's got to be it's got to be like the Archies, you know. Yeah, I, I, t I think you maybe this is the episode you did with Rob, but I know you've said on one of your previous episodes that this is a this is another example of Jack, one of Jack Kirby's like boy gangs. You know, mm -hmm. he was. He yeah. was in a boy gang when he was a youth and he just kind of tries That's to recreate that. He multiple times throughout his career, Marvel and DC, you know, and uh, the team brigade is another example of that. And, but they still remain largely anonymous. It's like, I don't know who these guys are, but, no. um, but you know, they're, they're used to get effect by oh. here and there, these early issues. Again, Stan leans on two things, plot and snappy dialogue, not a lot of characterization. Maybe the villains get some, Kang gets a little bit, that's about it. All right, gonna move us along here. So the teen brigade goes over, pretends to go over to Kang's side, and they go in there and they decide to sabotage his weapons. I, I'm sorry, and, you got, you, I'm sorry. I know you want to go fast. I, I want to go fast too, but you back up one page. So I've mentioned, uh, well, when I, on, uh, on the podcast with you a couple years ago, we were talking about the Kree Scroll War, and I mentioned that. Uh, in addition to the destiny power that Rick Jones manifests at the very end of that story, right? I suggested that he also has a sidekick power, where he, <laughs> has, he has the ability to become anybody's sidekick, and that's one of his superpowers. It he is. Does, he does it with Hulk. He does it with Steve Rogers, mm -hmm. and he does it with Marvel. Mm -hmm. We we see that sidekick power work on Ronan, the accuser mm -hmm. in the Kree Scroll War. And I'm telling you, it's happening right here on this page with Kane. He just says, you know, we, the earth doesn't stand a chance against you. We want to be on your side. And that's all it takes for Kane to say, you know what? You're right. I'm going to let you get on my ship unsupervised. You just see yourself around like you're, you're, you're with me now. I mean, this the only reason this works is because it's Rick Jones. He's the one with the sidekick power. Well, and it's playing on Kane's vanity that of course these people would want to be on his side you know it, he he can't imagine people wouldn't line up to take like, his side finally here's somebody with some brains of course they know exactly <laughs> yeah oh here are the earthlings from this century that have brains They're, so yes the board. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. He he thinks that the Avengers are the fools, right? But um, but yeah, and I was going to say you could even make an argument he was almost Genus's sidekick, but he would probably argue they were more equals in that book. Okay. I think it was kind of like a side by side. Yeah. All right. You stop me when you see something you want to comment on because there's not a whole lot I want to comment on through here. Okay. It's just Kang doing Kang stuff and the the Teen Brigade are running around sabotaging him, kind of like Johnny Storm on Galactus's ship. And then Thor comes back and busts out and gets the Avengers out. And my gosh, Iron Man, come on. <laughs> what the crap? Kirby did not do a good Iron Man. He did not do a good Spider-Man. No, no. Um, okay, so Jan and some ants fly back with a gun. And it's <laughs> some kind of an acid gun, I believe. And There, then there might be an easier way to transport a gun, but, you know. There might be. Uh, uh, yeah, clearly, yeah. Jan had an open carry license. Um <laughs> Then, um, yeah, so Hank gets the gun and Thor is hammering away at the force field as he likes to do. This happens a lot with Engelhart too, where Thor is just like a force field that mighty Mjolnir cannot penetrate. Oh, we'll see about that. Blam, blam, blam. And that's all he ever does is banging on it. And then uh, Hank shoots him with acid and he starts to fall apart. That's pretty cool, actually, that Kang starts to fall apart. I like that. So he launches a missile, a neutrino missile. Yeah, I like the the panel of a uh, giant man shooting from prone position with. Uh, oh yeah, that's uh, that's some good technique there. That's, uh, Jack that's got good. that pose just right. Oh, well, he Jack knew his infantry man. Come on, yeah. he was he was a ground pounder. Absolutely. So Iron Man stops a missile, kind of like in what Avengers, the first Avengers movie, and um, <laughs> Hank starts melting his shit next. That's the idea, son. I like when Hank starts <laughs> calling people son. You when you're a when you're an arch villain and Pym is calling you son, <laughs> you've you been should retreat, <laughs> strategic retreat, and regroup and rethink your whole career, Kang. Yeah, and then this is cool. This is cool. Thor uses the hammer to draw in the radiation. That's kind of what he does in Avengers 171 when they defeat Ultron and Ultron's going to blow up and Thor draws in all that energy from Ultron and shoots it up into space where it explodes up in the sky. Ah, okay, cool. So I thought this is not the last time we see Thor, you know, using the hammer as like a siphon. That's that's not the last time. That's pretty cool. But What's hilarious to me is the quick reversal Kang has. If you look lower left corner on the first page, he says, in the world of the future, we are immune to radiation. radiation. Yes, like, yes. On the second panel of the next page, he's like, oh, no, you made it too strong. I got to get out of here. Ah! <laughs> he's running away. I didn't know it was that much radiation. Oh, that's no, no, a whole no, other that story. Much. Whoa, whoa, no. That's, yeah, I have limits to my invulnerability, Thor. So, yeah, that's really good. So Kang takes off. He, he, I thought he turned invisible. He escapes into time. I don't know how Hank knew that, but we'll just assume <laughs> he knows he's escaping into time. And of course, Cap looks up and says, yes, perhaps, but the Avengers will be waiting. And we get a nice little shot of them there. And there's the team brigade and all that. So that's cool. So that's the first appearance of Kang. And I mean, it, yeah. I mean, I think it does pretty much what, uh, what a 1964 first appearance of Kang needs to do. It establishes that he's a kind of a time traveling megalomaniacal villain and that he, I think the most important thing in some ways that we learn about Kang here is that he was bored by a sort of a Star Trek future where everything is the, the glorious workers paradise, you know, and he wants to come back. I mean, he's kind of like the Robert E. Howard of the 30th century. He wants to come back to a time when men were men and women were women. And, you know, you fought for what you had and all that. I mean, I, I, and it's, I think it's, I was going to say he probably shouldn't have stopped in the 20th century. He should have gone back a couple more. But of course, later on, we see Kang in the 19th century in the old West, which I think is probably where he should have gone from the first place, you know? So where he encounters a two gun kid among others. Yeah. So obviously, you know, it's important that he escapes at the end. Uh, this is, this was, a, uh, this was a concept for a character that, um, was, was fertile ground. And, and I think Stan knew it. So it, um, Better Kang stories would come, but we needed the first one. And and this is, no matter what you may think of the hokiness or the corniness of some of the dialogue and, and all that kind of stuff, this is historically significant. This is, uh, it is. This is, this is a treasure. I think that maybe he knew from the beginning this could be the Avengers Doctor Doom. And that he even begins to explicitly say they're related. Yeah, that's true. Is it in, is it in this issue? Well... <sighs> 
I can't remember. You might have missed it, but I know if it's not in this one, it's in um, the in the number ten, one of the two, with with a yeah. mortis or something. But I know that at some point he says, "My descendant, Doctor, yeah. my my ancestor, Doctor Doom." Yeah, and right. we get that from almost the beginning. So, mm. um, I don't think there's anything of note in the letter column here. I did see a Steve Gerber letter somewhere, but I don't think it's in this issue. Oh, okay. Um. So. Let us go to Avengers number nine. Now, this is another really important issue. We had the introduction of Kang, and it's really remarkable to realize how early on Simon Williams, Wonder Man, makes his first appearance, Avengers number nine. I mean, we know it because they referenced it all the time back when, you know, you and I were reading it originally as kids, but that's pretty, that's like in the first 12 issues, you know, you get, Wonder Man, and and you get Wonder Man in that Christmassy costume that he wears again later in the seventies. Yeah. So whenever we, uh, you see, whenever we discuss like the history of Avengers roster or membership, or you see it listed, it kind of goes from the founders to the Kooky Quartet. It's like everybody forgets that. Nope. You know, in issue mm -hmm. number nine, Wonder yeah. Man officially joins the team. He yeah. was the first member outside of if you count Cap. Captain America as a, as a founder, um, um, he's the first non-founding member to join the team. Um, that's you know, it's right here. That's a good point. I also want to point out, by the way, something we've been following along here on this show, which is we've now gone several issues without the Hulk and without Submariner. The mm -hmm. first several issues of this series really were the Hulk and the Submariner versus the other Avengers, and. Which was weird when you consider that in some ways, none of them are villains, right? I mean, the Hulk's not a villain and the Submariner acts like a villain. But, you know, it was always clear that Stan and Jack loved Namor and they used him as an adversary, but always an honorable adversary that had reasons. Yeah, that, um, you, I mean, I guess you could say anti-hero, but you're right. They just yeah. they had a little bit of attitude problem, but yeah. um, they could also be the protagonist of their story. And... Um, you know, I think that's something that um, differentiated Marvel uh, from the competition. You know, the, yeah. the, it was it, it's still kind of broad strokes, but you can say it's they're like shades of gray. They're like they're not necessarily awesome, you know, upstanding citizens, but they're they're still the hero of their book and um, not necessarily squeaky clean like the DC heroes were. Yeah, yeah, and it's but it, it is interesting that that we had sort of that we had the Hulk Namor storyline for a while. Now we've been having the masters of evil storyline starting with, I guess, issue six. six and seven. Yeah. There. So, all right. So let's dig into this one a little bit. Uh, okay. the original Baron Zemo still hanging around the, the, the guy whose superpower is that his mask got glued to his face. I just, I, I don't know what to do with that. And Z Zemo uh, premiered in Avengers number six, right? He didn't, he's not yes. a tell the suspense guy. He's not no. a gold age guy. No. no, he was a new creation. Oh, I always assumed he was from back in the day and they brought him back along with Captain America, but no, that was the first time he appeared anywhere. Okay. So all the, all the story we get later about uh, Bucky's death on the drone plane and it's Zemo they're escaping from. That's, that's all. That's, that's all. 1963. Yeah. That's, that's all 1963. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Zemo, you know, I, I love Zemo here. I've never quite understood why a couple of Asgardians chose to hang out with Zemo and let him be the leader. But, I know. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it, this, is your, this is your classic uh, early Masters of Evil. Yeah, it is. It really is. And I love that Cap's just nuts here. He's, <laughs> Zemo is not attacking him. He's just like in his bedroom throwing his shield at the wall because he's so obsessed with Baron Zemo. They have to hold him down. By the way, this is another Don Heck and Dick Ayers, and there's no colorist again uh, credited. This is the first Don Heck issue, and Don Heck would remain the primary artist on the series all the way up through the the late 30s, or early 40s in terms of issue numbers. Yeah. Uh, he would uh, he would he would be on the book for a while, and I think he would come back in the future. But but here we have Don Heck, uh, his first issue on the series. So we we see we were reminded that Zemo and uh, Amora and what's his name, the executioner, Scourge, um, Scourge, yeah, they were hurled 
into a different universe and they the the enchantress finally decides oh you don't want to be here anymore well sure i can i can bring us back and like well thanks amora for doing that <laughs> and so they come back to south america to the to the jungle headquarters and they're unhappy and i'm gonna zip along here you stop me if you see anything oh that's really cool how you did that um Meanwhile, we find out that there's a guy named Simon Williams who is getting, who is in trouble for embezzlement. And it has to do with his competition with Tony Stark and Stark International or whatever they're calling Tony's company at this point. And so basically, I'm like, is that Amora? And I look over here, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she could be anybody, but there's only one, you know, dude with like eyebrows on the top of his. <laughs> Ed, so yeah, that's him. So they recruit uh, Mr. Simon Williams, and uh, meanwhile, God, look, the, Steve. I mean, I know it, it looks like you no know, Don Heck. Uh, prior to like the Marvel Age, uh, you know, prior to Fantastic Four number one and all that era, in the late fifties, early sixties, Don Heck was drawing romance comics. Yeah, and, uh, I see in this panel of Steve Rogers pining away for Bucky, uh, Don Heck, using all his romance muscles uh, drawing this panel. I think Don Heck would say he's pining away for bloody revenge on Zemo, but <laughs> yes, it's because he, of his dear friend, uh, James Buchanan Barnes, that he feels that way. So, all right. Uh, we will now see Zemo's genius at work. And it's, oh, he's so using... We, this is are, a big moment, David. I was going to say, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, th this is Simon Williams receiving the ionic rays. Mm -hmm. This yes. is, this is, uh, this is it. This is it happening live in front of us on stage, so to speak. And um, it, it's, it's constantly referred to throughout his, the future history of the character. So um, many that, references that is, throughout. Yeah. Yeah. Massive moment. Uh, historically, again, historically significant moment for a character that would prove to, to last and be with us all these decades. And have ramifications going forward because he, he dies, he comes back. Uh, he doesn't like thinking about how he died once and then he finds out he's not even really alive the second time. He's just a being of ionic energy. And then he becomes kind of a being of ionic energy there for a while. And then there's the whole business with the vision and the brain patterns and yep. Wanda. And it's just a whole can of worms getting opened up by Zemo doing this. Yep. Zemo and, uh, has no idea what he's doing when he does this. His his future uh, resurrections and, the, and his future um, adjustments or changes in his powers... It's all it's all based on this origin of getting yeah. the ionic rays. So this is a this is a pivotal Marvel moment right here. Here is something I don't know the answer to, and it just occurred to me. I don't know if you're going to know the answer to it. We haven't ever met the Grim Reaper yet, have we? I don't yeah. think so. <laughs> Simon doesn't come back until years later i'm assuming the grim reaper appears for the first time before wonder man comes back to life is he recognized as eric williams from the get-go is he recognized as wonder man's brother from the get-go even before wonder man comes back to life yeah um no i'm going on vague memory here i, I have read these issues but it's been a while but um as i understand as i recall uh, in Grim Reaper's first appearance, he's he's out for revenge. He blames the Avengers for his brother's death. So he that he's makes, established yeah. up front yeah. as Simon's brother, and he's he's upset that Simon's gone. Is 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 it his first appearance when he's in like the yellow and green horrible costume, and he's with Ultron, and he's fighting Black Panther? Yes, yes. I think that's it. All right, all right. So so, so, so one thing Roy Thomas uh, always did, or I should say, often did when he introduced new characters, especially in, especially in Avengers is he would look back. He would find yeah. something in a back issue or in the history the golden age, right. Or, or maybe in the fifties when it comes to black Knight, or, um, and in this case, he's the one who I wouldn't say created wonder man, but he brought wonder man back. Uh, yes. first. Um, and he did it by looking back at this issue, number nine and finding a way to, to bring that character back and use him. And so, Grim Reaper is also Roy Thomas creation. And he was, it was a, a way to just build on the past. Roy was always looking to link back to the past because he loved, he loved to uh, enrich that continuity 
Um, he also didn't want to give Marvel anything that was just completely wholly new and, and from completely his own imagination. So he always built on what had come before. So, um, we, you know, Wonder Man doesn't, you know, all the stuff we think of of Wonder Man came later with uh, Conway and Shooter and all the stuff after that. But Roy Thomas was the first one to start playing with Simon again. And, and that included his his brother, the Grim Reaper. Yeah. I, I got to say, when I think about Grim Reaper, the one thing always annoyed me about him, it's one of those things where when you're like eight years old, I'm sure the, the thing on his hand with the blade was cool. But I just feel like he'd have been so much cooler if he actually had a big scythe as opposed to the little helicopter blade thing on yeah. his hand. Which and he put different attachments on it, like, you know. Yeah. Penguin 66. I don't know. Yeah. Oh Lord. Just, uh, <laughs> um, all right. So whoop, hold on. There it goes. All right. So he comes out, he's basically gotten the super soldier formula, but even more right. so mm -hmm. they test him. He's tearing things up. And they have and, a costume ready for him because there's already a plan to try to insert him into the Avengers. Yeah. So that's why they already have a costume ready to go. And yeah, we get a few power demonstrations. So we, we have an idea well, of who he is. People laugh about the colors of it and everything and the W and all. But what I always liked about this costume is that it doesn't have sleeves and it's got the big wrist gauntlet, the big wrist um, van braces or whatever. Mm -hmm. That to me, it's like, look at my guns. I'm a big arm punching guy. And his, and, and his, and his, 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 he doesn't have a mask. He's got like a helmet. It's almost like a construction worker. Helmet. I, and the belt, everything about his costume, forget the colors or whatever. I love this costume because it, everything about this costume, except for the Christmas colors, emphasizes what his powers are, that he's a blue collar, hardcore, strong punching guy. And, and those, the, 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 the tank top aspect of it, you know, the, the wristbands, the helmet, the goggles, that bell, everything to me about it just works as the costume of a guy whose thing is punching the crap out of you. I just think <laughs> it works. I really do. I don't, I don't get all the criticism of it. And I thought that the one that they redid later, it's got some yellow in it. I thought that was good too, mm. because it, again, it emphasized his arms and that's what he is. He's an arm guy. He's a punch you guy, you know, his fist, it is hard as Thor's hammer famously. So <laughs> that's uh. but anyway, so, all right, we're going to, um, they have the plan in motion where the Avengers are going to confront the, uh, the masters of evil. And then, oh, look, they're being helped oh, more boys to men, uh, but they're being helped out. Dang, it's wanting to go far by Wonder Man jumping in from out of nowhere. And of course, Wonder Man is going to beat them up and cause them to have to escape. Right. Right. And then. And then that get that's his end. That's his ticket to join the team. And they're watching, I guess. It is almost too easy. What a victory for Zemo. <laughs> and and so you get this whole duplicity thing here. I'm gonna move us along. Um, where oh, I do like this though. I gotta mention this because I have a problem with this, and it, it's probably just being picky with some clumsy writing, but Simon's cover story is not bad, right? He says, I escaped from Zemo. And Captain America's like, whoa, hold on there, buddy. You couldn't have escaped from Zemo. Therefore, you must be lying and this whole thing is a trick. <laughs> I'm like, dang, Steve, you're going to just jump to some conclusions on us here? Good gosh. Um, so How do you make that leap? I know, you're right. It's probably a case of they have to get this whole story done in one issue and so you just gotta get to the plot point you know as quickly I as guess. <laughs> dang I just yeah so then the enchantress is like you must save him he is di uh, dying you must so Cap's like oh that's why you sought us you're dying from a rare disease and we could find a cure oh well in that case it's all good that's yeah. much more plausible than you just escaped from the bad guy and, and it's a thought that just popped in his head randomly out of nowhere. And, but now he's totally. Ah, yeah. I, and so they're working. I just, that, yeah, it, it seems like every issue or two Stan comes up with a little plot contrivance that I'm just going. Yes. One thing that's, I guess, interesting here. So what we know uh, 
having read all the Wonder Man stories that have come after this, is that a recurring theme with Simon is is death, fear of death. You mm-hmm. know, what does it mean to be alive? Oh well, yeah, uh, yeah, dying. And here in this very first appearance, it's about his impending death. I mean, yeah. the the thought coming into Cap's brain here is he's dying. You got to save him. And the whole reason he's going along with Zemo's plot here is because he needs the antidote to stay alive. So this whole death, life, whatever is is uh, is present in, in in Simon's stories from the very first appearance. And I'm it's absolutely right. And I'm going to give a little bit of credit to Don Heck and Dick Ayers. This is an awesome Tony Stark. Hmm. This is better than Tony's looked anywhere so far. And this is not a great Iron Man, but it's by far the best Iron Man we've seen in the Avengers so far. And Heck was the original artist on Iron Man, right? And when he was introduced in Tales of Suspense? Yeah. I want to say so. It seems like it. He was there a long time back in the day. So, But before you turn the page, though, I want you to take note I'm, of the Hank and Colin, Colin's in there, too, and that confuses me always. I get the two of them, yeah. Mixed up. Okay. Well, take note here of the Hank and Jan panel on the left. Okay. Uh, they're getting like he's she's ready to go out on a date and he's just like, Good night, Jan. You know, like, you know, talk to the <laughs> hand. I'm busy. Um oh, golly, I did I missed that the first time. Wow. Yeah, he's, he doesn't look at her. He's just like, Good night, Jan. And then his and he's his thoughts immediately have nothing to do with her, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, I wonder yes. if his illness can be cured by biochemistry. But but I want you to see that there they are together in his lab and she's just dressed up to go out in the town. Take note of that because we're going to see Jan again on the very next page in a very different situation. All right, let's remember that. But I just want to note here, this is the same dynamic that Stan was doing and Jack were doing with Reed and Sue in the Fantastic Four. The difference is they never had Reed go bananas and punch <laughs> Sue in the face and become a super villain or whatever. So it's like Hank let Stan and Hank let whoever do stuff that they couldn't do to the Fantastic Four. And I can understand that, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they went darker right. path. <laughs> no, they sure did. I'm gonna take note of that. Now where are we going? Uh, all right. We are now in South America. We jumped oh, in South America. And she's a Captive in a costume. She's already a prisoner in South America. So there's an untold tale there. There is. Well, it is a few days later. A few few days days later later in South America. Those were days that must not have gone well for Janet. She she is now. Mm. (laughs) There really is. You're right. There's an untold tale of the Avengers waiting to be told of how Jan got captured by the Masters of Evil. And clearly she was fighting them because she's not in her dress. She's in a she's in a costume, right? right. So she, she was able there was to a battle we didn't see. Yep, she put up a fight. And and, uh, and more credit. Well, Iron Man's back to looking like garbage again. But this is a good Thor. <laughs> yep. This is a really good Thor. I mean, um, that's honestly, I'm gonna say this. I, I'm look, my Avengers credentials are as established as anybody. I'm gonna say this. That's a better Thor right there than any Thor that Jack gave us in the first eight issues. Um, again, uh, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. That's a hot take. That's a hot, take. a hot take. That's coming but, in hot, man. But I, I am not going to argue with that. But we do know that Jack is the Thor artist. He's, oh, uh, yeah. but, yeah. Um, but of course, he, he, like I said before, he puts he put all his energy in the Thor comic, like. He loved and, Fantastic Four and he loved Thor and everything else was just a rush job. You, you know, I mean, saying that Jack is the Thor artist carries a lot of extra weight when you consider John Bashima and Walt Simonson. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's... Well, okay, let me, let me, let me put it this way. Because I... I don't I, disagree with you either. No, but, but I probably would put both those guys above Kirby. But I'll say this. Those three, if you're doing a Mount Rushmore of Thor artists, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the first three right there. Yeah, my personally, I would put Perez on there too, just for what he did in the Avengers. But I'm no sure artists. that there's some, yeah. there's probably somebody else that I'm forgetting that just did Thor. So it, it, it would not all, all, all power to him. It would not be Jr. Jr. 
No, but you could go uh, Ron Friends. You could go Oliver Coypel. You, know. you could. Do you know what I got to say though, is for Jr. Jr.? God bless him. Sweetest human being I've ever spoken yes, to. I interviewed Jr. Jr. a year ago for Dragon Con video, for Dragon Con TV. And bless his heart, I can't say anything bad about him. He's the nicest guy I ever talked to. And he said when he was drawing Thor, he pasted Kirby art all over his wall. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, I can't say, I can't gainsay you that. You know what I mean? That's respect. Respect. He he respected <laughs> his, uh, his predecessor for sure. Um, all right. So we get fight, fight. Oh, giant magnet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the single funniest thing that has been said on this series so far, I think, was <laughs> Luke. Luke talking about Big Magnet. Oh my God, I about <laughs> fell on the floor when he said that. that, was, that, in, that was <laughs> and there it is again, man. There Big Magnet in action. Influence being seen in these stories, yeah. Uh, you gotta love it. Yeah, Iron Man, Iron Man always had trouble with uh, Big Magnet <laughs> and, and Rust. So, <laughs> Rust, yes. <laughs> oh Lord. And the Melter thought he could get in on some of that action as well, but it never worked out too well for him. All right, so more fi that's a good wonder. There's a fist to the face. Wow, that's uh that's some serious action right there. I mean, seriously. And then so Wonder Man, Giant Man getting beat up, and here comes Iron Man and getting swung around. It's not looking good. The, you know, Wonder Man, this looks like what Wonder Man's trying to do to the vision a few issues later. Or, well, a few years later, right? In that <laughs> famous 158. And then Kurt Kurt brought it back again, which was awesome, which was so oh. great. This is this is not far away from what Hulk does to Loki in the first movie. That is true. Wow, yeah. <laughs> that is true. Um, and then, again, some more. At, God, Iron Man. Why can't y'all draw Iron Man? My gosh. I can't draw, David. And I could draw Iron Man better than this. I'm just saying. Um, but so, getting more fighting. Here's the secret to drawing Iron Man. And I heard this straight from Bob Layton's mouth. Oh, well, that's the man. Yeah. You don't draw him like a regular person. You draft him like a sports car. You've yeah. got to, you, you don't, don't draw the clothes and the gloves like it's made out of fabric. You've got to use your drafting tools and understand that you're, you're drafting a piece of precision machinery. Yeah, I like it. Well, and he'd be on the Mount Rushmore for sure of Iron Man artists. There's no, no doubt about yeah, that. Number one. I put, all right, so my, my, the top three for Iron Man, Bob yeah. Layton, yeah. George, George Perez. Sure. And I'm going to go Keith Pollard. Okay. I don't know who the fourth I, one is. But those are my three. I, well, Eric Granoff. Okay. Gets in there uh, just because he influenced the movie and everything else, the movies and all. I mean, he's had more impact probably than anybody, honestly. And, you know, to honestly, um, the guys that were drawing Iron Man back in the Bill Mantlo era and even before that, Tuska. And Colin, um, they lay down, laid down what old shellhead should look like back, you know, late sixties, early seventies. And I okay. you know, give them full respect. So, okay. Um, let's see. So, oh, there's a, this is a really good cover, by the way. I like this, uh, tales of suspense cover right there. It, isn't it amazing to see these, these old house ads, for just what, how many classic comics were just coming out like hand over fist every single week? Same, it's, the same weeks. Yeah. It's just amazing. Crazy. Um, all right. So Iron Man's getting crushed by a rock. There's uh, the Enchantress. Again, just in, I, I do love the way that Stan wrote dialogue for Zemo. I mean, he sounds like Dime Store Dr. Doom, but that's fun. I like it. You know, none question Zemo's commands. Remember, <laughs> if I do not choose to give you your life saving antidote, you will be dead within hours. And so he's Wonder Man keeps helping, but then he changes sides. <laughs> now, I have, I take issue with Heck here because you see, you know, you don't know who it is that did it here. He says, Who dares? And then they tell us it's Wonder Man, but shouldn't they kind of have, shouldn't this panel be Wonder Man standing there like defiant with another rock? I dare, I'm, you know, and then you have the reaction of the villains. But I, I, I just. But we, eh. we, we barely get Wonder Man at all in that page. It's like, you don't ever get a good look at him. No, you have a little bit of him here and a little bit of him here. And that's it. And the entire thing is about him. This is the page where he changes sides. 
and redeems himself, and yet you barely see him. This so that's a big, big heroic turn. I wonder. Yeah, I, I wonder like how that's... much of this is a disconnect in the Marvel method of, uh, of, of you know, Stan having to try to wrest the story from the art, you know, just through dialogue. Uh, with, with, when the art's not really giving him what he wished it did, I don't know. I'm guessing, but you're yeah. right. This is, this Bad is choices were made here. This is more than just a uh, a hero moment in the story. This is this is Simon Williams' defining moment. This is what redeems him and makes makes him a good guy. Makes him an Avenger. Well, think about this from today's perspective. How many different panels do we see on this spread? Eighteen. Oh, Eight. <laughs> Holy crap. That's a lot of panels. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, 18 yeah. panels. Okay, so finally they run off again as they do, and they're getting being chased, and they try to Zemo tries to trick them with the old James Bond villain, blow up the secret headquarters and kill the heroes. But uh giant man grabs them with his oh, look how he's <laughs> He's going to pull Cap's pants off if he's not careful there. Got a handful of his pants, my gosh. And then there's the blast. So that was cool. What about him? And he's still alive in his last few moments before uh, he goes. And, and it's kind of appropriate that Iron Man is there holding him since it was the rivalry with Stark, you know, that kind of prompted the whole thing. Thus, we take our leave of the Mighty Avengers and the Fallen Wonder Man, but be prepared for new surprises when we meet again next issue. They never really seem to know what was coming up in the next issue. They always no. just knew it would be good. Th th those final blurbs always struck me as, we don't really know what's coming, but I I'm sure you're going to love it. You know, sure you'll I, love it. It'll be great. I mean, it's, It'll it's be great. great. I mean, just, yeah. just trust us. Just trust us. Um, Sometimes they would have it in the letters page, but which I guess was made later, but not in the actual story. Um, you know, you have to you have to look past the the sense the storytelling sensibilities of 1964, and you got to look past the uh, the rushed pace and the um, and some of the corny dialogue. But if you look at the structure of the story, if you look at the skeleton of the story, this is a great issue. This is a this yeah. is a good issue. You get uh, Simon's origin. Uh, it's not told in flashback, right? The origin is seen in real time. He's yeah. He, he's in trouble. They recruit him. Uh, they basically exploit his desperation. They subject him to these rays, and they they use him to. This is like early Thunderbolts, right? He can also be the first Thunderbolt. He infiltrates yeah, that's the, true. Uh, the Avengers um, yeah. with uh, led by Zemo, and then, you know, and mm -hmm. he's. Um, but then he has the heroic turn, and and the team recognizes that and realizes the heroic sacrifice. And that's they give him full honors as an Avenger. So, but but he but we think he's done. And it's I mean, by the time he ever comes back, I mean we're talking four or five years from now. And so, as far as readers of the day were concerned, this was it. Wonder Man was one and done. And uh, what what a great wonderful story. But at the same time, all the future writers have done a good job of building on the themes that we have in this issue, primarily you know, but the questions of life and death. And also using the gimmick of the Ionic race to just uh, tell so many more future stories. And everything about Wonder Man that we know, it's actually all right here in this one right issue. I, 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 I'm a big fan of, of this issue. I have to be honest. I'm not a big fan. I, you've heard me say this before. I am not a big fan of Don Heck's artwork. I know that he was an important artist for Marvel and he worked a long time. And all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure he was an awesome dude. But um, his superhero comics, to me, always felt a little stiff and a little lacking. Um, but uh, this issue is one of my favorites because I think it's got so... It, it delivers on so much that, that, that proved to be consistent with everything we know about the character. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, something that occurs to me, too, is how different time passes for us when we're little versus later. Because if you told me that something happened in the comics 12 years ago now, I'd be like, oh, that was like yesterday, right? 12 years ago is nothing in Marvel, right? That would mean that it happened in 20, 2010, right? 
Right. So in other words, something that something that happened something that happened twelve years ago happened four years after Civil War. That's crazy. think about that. Isn't that crazy? That's insane. That, that's, that's, that's that's nothing. But yeah. think about this: from this issue until they bring Wonder Man back as a zombie, and then bring him back in like one fifty eight, and he fights the Vision, is only twelve years. That's that's that's. Back, Back when I was reading those those issues where he came back and I was finding out about this backstory, it seemed to me like about the same as the Civil War, about a, the, the real Civil War. You know what I mean? Like back in the 1800s sometime when Wonder Man first appeared and then now here we are in 1977. It, it's crazy and it's a trick. I think our minds play on us when we get to be the age yeah. we are now. Because, yeah. you know, you tell me that 20 years ago was 2002. I mean, I know. <laughs> that, that can't be right. I mean, I'm pretty sure that 1980 was 20 years ago. You know? At some I, point, the past quit receding further away, and all other time gets compressed into like a week. It's actually true. Absolutely true. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure I'm about 29 years old. I think that's about how old I am. Yeah. Look, I I said top of the show. I started reading Avengers in 1981, and I did go back and and fill up those first 210 issues I missed. And I bought the series going forward up through 2003, 2004. Well, that's that's barely 20 years. It just as much time has passed since I quit reading yeah. as I spent reading. And I feel like I'm a lifelong fan, but at this point, it's more like half my life. And that's, that's no, crazy. absolutely. Like I don't know what I don't know what happened to time. I think oh, I think yeah. we can blame Kang or Rama Tut. <laughs> It's true. I mean, my first stint reading Marvel seemed at the time to be my entire life. And it kind of was. And it was from about 77 to 80, 83. It was like six years. And yet that at the time, that seemed like eternity. But it was also all of your conscious life, right? Because you were too young mm -hmm. to remember anything else prior to that. So Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how that works. But yeah. All right. Oh, I think there we have... Uh, is this not, oh, dang it. It must've been that fantastic. It was in that fantastic four. So when we get together at some point, if we are able to, and talk about fantastic four, number 19, there's a Steve Gerber letter in it, which oh, I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's the Rama. Uh, issue. Yeah. We should cover that. Yeah. 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 So there we go. And then there's of course the old Abe Vigoda <laughs> fish is, is doing art there. But, uh, anyway, that brings us to the end. I'm going to go all the way back to the famous Wonder Man. So we talked about Kang. We talked about Wonder Man. We got the masters of evil who are always lurking around. And then as I, I've already covered number 10 where we get Immortus, and then it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of that. So, uh, any final thoughts, David? Hey, first Kang, first Wonder Man. These two issues are gigantic. You, yeah. you these, these yeah. are critical. Look, you know, these aren't our favorite stories, right? Because the writing got more nuanced and, and it got more, I mean, it got more modern in a, in just about every way. Very but quickly, actually. Remarkably very, quickly. Yeah. So, but what you got to look at with these, these, these first couple of years is what are the significant milestones that are hit? You know, what are the things that would have future ramifications in the series? And uh, these are two of the biggest, Kang and Wonder Man. I mean, this, these, these are absolute critical foundational issues. Yeah, it is. There you go. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode, David. Thank you for joining us. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Absolutely. All right. We're going to see you guys down the road with our next episode where we'll talk about issue, I think, number 11 and maybe a little bit beyond that. And we do have an episode coming up. I'll just go ahead and mention coming up in the near future. Shoot, where I believe um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think we've got a couple more guests that are scheduled to come up in a in a few couple episodes to talk about. Uh, for sure, we've got the big uh, the old order changeth uh, issue where the, the, the these the founders kind of leave and we get Hawkeye and uh, and Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. So, awesome. all right, hey, we'll I'm uh, I'm game for any any issue you want to bring me in for in the future. Just let me know, holler at me. We will do. It. We will do it. All right.